This episode of Capes and Lunatics is brought to you by Tweaked Audio. To get awesome headphones, go to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get 30% off, free shipping, and a lifetime warranty. Or you can get there through the link on our website, southgatemediagroup.com. This is DG Chichester, and you're listening to the Capes and Lunatics podcast. That's right. We're back for another episode of Capes and Lunatics. To me, Phil, it's a little as hellfire, of course. And we have a very special guest. If you've read Daredevil in the 90s, I'm sure you probably have read at least some of issues written by this man. He wrote many. Mr. D.G. Chichester. Hello, sir. How are you? Hello, Phil. Hello, Lilith. Thank you guys for having me on. It's, uh, it's, I, love the, I love your podcast. I love the name of your podcast. It's a lot of fun to be here. Yes, yeah, some of us are capes, some of us are lunatics. <laughs> it should really be singular. I'm the lunatic. We all oh, know. you're the lunatic. Okay. Yeah, I'm the lunatic. Okay. I love the moon. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes. Yeah, so, um, I, w- I was doing my homework. I I heard an older podcast with you. I've been trying to do some reading. So, mm-hmm. I was uh, very interested. It's like I guess you've always you knew you always wanted to be a writer. Oh yeah, I mean it's 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 a a curse and a gift, I guess, you know, at a certain point you realize stories are something you can tell yourself by putting some words down. And I I probably could still find some really God awful, uh, HP Lovecraft inspired, you know, stories that I cobbled together, you know, when I was very young and, and continued on and, and hopefully got better, but it was, it's, it's something I've always identified myself with no matter what role I've had. Ultimately, I always call myself a writer. And the ver- the most interesting thing I from those early years I saw was um I guess you were a big DC guy not a, not even a Marvel guy like as oh a kid. yeah it, absolutely it was um my brother had Marvel uh, comics and he had, he at one point he had a subscription to a bunch of them but they never struck a chord with me for whatever reason um, maybe I was too shallow uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I would uh, when I would go on my comics run to not even a comic store at that point but just the the local newsstand I would just come back with with bags of DC comics. And I like the, the, the characters, the, the universe, the environment, the justice league, Phantom stranger. I mean, these were, you know, characters that really resonated with me. The, the one letter I ever wrote to a comic was to firestorm, you, you know, and, and, uh, and that was what my, my crew dresser drawer comic collection. I, I wasn't smart enough to have a, uh, uh, you know, comic boxes even, you know, it was just, I took all the clothes, stuck them in the closet and then all the dresser dressers in my room became just all the comics stacked and organized that's funny you say that yes as a kid i had at least two or three dresser drawers full of comics (laughs) just the horror of it all appreciate your books folks oh yeah no no but i mean they were really well they they were their own space make no mistake they definitely had everything organized and you know the little dresser to the side was all the the horror comics and the house of mysteries and the eeries and then over here was very particular they're well cared for well cared for i mean i i'm sure i short boxes i like it (laughs) i mean i'm sure i had a daredevil drawer lilith and i'm sure most of them in there were uh Mr. Chichester's here. His issues. Oh, make it Dan. Make it Dan. Okay, please. Dan. All right. <laughs> yes. Uh, I just remember, you know, because when did you start? 91. I was 13 years old. I remember sitting by the neighborhood pool talking to some kids about, you know, oh, did you see that last? Did you see uh, issue uh, 293 with the Punisher? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I think, yeah, I think it was 292, 293. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a good one to jump into. We had some good good plans, and I think executed on on a lot of them. Oh yeah. Um, 
And were you a big Batman fan growing <clears throat> growing up? Yeah, I love Batman. I mean, Batman, uh, you know, Denny O'Neill's, you know, Batman, I think was a big influence, especially as they were shifting things through. And then as I got more into comics, you know, as many people do, you start to you know, ply into the, the back issues and then you start to discover even more of the stories that you missed the first time around. So I was I was lucky enough that my parents would indulge me as we'd go on road trips as I was a kid. Um, and then we would find, again, not a comic store, but a used bookstore or that sort of thing that had uh, piles of comics. There was one in Vermont, I remember really distinctly, uh, Putney, Vermont, because we used to go to, for a lot of summer trips up there. And this used bookstore, thrift store, junk store, whatever it was, just had a basement full of comics. And I would always make them go out of their way to go there. And then I would come back with a, a new haul and new capture. And a lot of those were definitely Batman influenced. I mean, I could tell. Well, I don't know if I could tell, but I mean, I, I like the way. I, I think I've never seen anyone else really do this. Like you, there are certain stories where you have uh, Daredevil, Matt Murdock, <clears throat> kind of like almost uh, whipping out the detective skills. Just like, especially with like the hypersensitive touch, it's like, oh yeah, why wouldn't you know? I love the senses. I mean, the senses oh, yeah. to me, you know, became such a a big part of of who he is and. Once you start to play there, you know, you get into these these whole ideas of what do you interpret from there? I mean, if you're looking at it from a character point of view, he's nowhere near the level of a detective as Batman is or should be. But uh, there's definitely aspects of understanding what those senses mean. They did a lot of nice things. I just rewatched uh, parts of the Netflix show and they, they did some of that on there, I think, really well, too, with those moments where he would hear feel something and then connect the dots uh, i thought they handled that really well yeah i mean again i love your writing just with those senses because i think a lot of times in the modern comics they forget about some of those senses or just uh i mean because even just setting the scene of things like if something's on fire and i know you had them like you know you could sell smell like the soot from the fire and you know just right all the senses combined and it's just I don't think yeah. I think the word you're looking for is competent. He made him competent. And people love competent <laughs> superheroes. I like that. that more grounded. <laughs> I like that. Um yeah, you know, it's 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 something to to really, you know, play out. The the one story, and we did a little bit of this. Um, I wrote it there was these uh, Marvel digital comics uh toward the end of the nineties or maybe the mid mid nineties, and they're called cyber comics. And uh I got a chance to do a Daredevil story in there that I had always wanted to tell in the book, which was really about a, a condition called synesthesia, where uh, it's a, it's a uh, mental condition where uh, the individuals who have this, their senses are mixed up. So they feel colors, you know, uh, they, they see sounds, like it's cross-wired in that way. And I always wanted to play with that with Daredevil and have him get into a, a situation where you know, those things became misfired and miswired. And we, we touched on it a little bit in the cyber comic, but I always thought that would be a good way to shake him up and, and then see how we could reconnect the dots in that way. All right. Here's then another coma. I'll tell you that. What do I need to do this month? <laughs> let me, let me put, let me put the character in a coma. I can, I can coast for a month, you know? <laughs> But no, I mean, all right, her, all right, Lil. Here's a question. I, you always say the Punisher is more competent when he's like playing off another character. I mean, do you think uh, with in these Daredevil issues, the Punisher is competent? Well, as competent as he can be, is he's probably allowed to be. I don't, you know, <laughs> there's probably like some some like status quo that they have to abide by and stuff. But I, I do like him. Like I said, Punisher team up. It makes more sense than a Daredevil team up at this point. <laughs> Daredevil and Punisher teamed up or Punisher teamed up with anybody? I think she thinks the, pun the Punisher needs anybody. a team up book, you know, like Spider-Man used to have just like a, every because she thinks, you know, the Punisher's written Spider better when he's when he's always playing off a different character, whether it's Daredevil or Spider-Man or whoever. I, I would I would agree with that. I mean, when I use the Punisher, it was it was always with somebody. And because he has such a particular worldview, um, you get to explore that worldview in a contrast with somebody else, which is always a, a way to to not have him necessarily doubt himself. He's a machine in, in certain ways, but you get to explore the themes uh, differently without him just having to doubt himself within his his own world. 
Um, but I always found that a rich territory when I got a chance to team him up with with a lot of folks. When Punisher's written well, it's just so good. And when yeah. not, it hurts my heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's easy to fall back on just, oh, he's a guy with a gun and a, and a revenge trip, and, uh, and you don't get to go anywhere with it. Uh, exactly. I did it. The show, the show on Netflix did such a great job with like the PTSD that a lot of veterans need to see so that they can get help and stuff like that. So it's just like, mm, I'd like to see that more in the book, you know? Yeah, John Bernthal um, uh, just personified that on so many different levels with that 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 level of trauma, uh, his body language, everything mm-hmm. about that was uh, unmistakably, you know, the, the character. Yeah, they I'm need- glad that the TV show for Daredevil exists because they definitely pulled from a lot of like the 90s stuff, which, yeah, my favorite era, not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> Introduced a-, a lot of people to the nuances of, you know, his character. Like, it's not just, oh, he's blind and he wears a red suit. Oh, right, he's a right. bad lawyer. <laughs> yeah, so many. Well, that was the funny thing watching it, you know, me and my son uh, and, you know, just came to that conclusion of like, yeah, Foggy's a pretty awesome lawyer. Matt, ah, he's got his moments, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> Poor Foggy. Been, I don't, I don't really know if I want Matt to be my lawyer anymore. You know? <laughs> do, do, you watch the, do you watch the show like differently after you've written the character for so long? You're just like, or are you just like, oh, that's cool how they did that, or eh, I don't know if I would have did that, or, you know. It, it was a really good experience actually to watch the show and, and, and come back into it both as a professional you know, who'd worked mm-hmm. on the character and personally a little bit too, because my son was right at the age where he was finally getting to the point where he was enjoying the characters. He'd come up through a lot of the Marvel you know, cinematic universe stuff and, and be charged up about that. So earlier on, you know, when dad re- wrote comics, wasn't so interesting to him. Now suddenly dad wrote comics. Here's a character dad wrote. And while they didn't necessarily pick up on a lot of the things I did, there was at least, you know, one or two, you know, I had named the, the chased, you know, sticks mm-hmm. group. And so then when they, when they name check that, that was nice. Uh, and, and while the, the costume, you know, they ultimately gave him wasn't the, the costume that you know, Scott McDaniel had designed the whole, the whole theory we had behind that costume of like, you're going to, you're going to, I hope I can swear. Can I swear on your podcast? Is that okay? If I just a little bit, you're getting the shit kicked out of you. You know, it, it's, it's okay if you got something aside from, yeah. you know, cotton on. And we took a lot of grief for that when we had that rationale in the in the Fall from Grace story. And so to have him show up in a, not body armor, but something that was more protective was uh, a little bit of a fun little validation. So I definitely watched it and appreciated what they were doing. I thought they did it extremely well, as opposed to, you know, say the Ben Affleck, you know, movie of many years ago, where it was like, eh, you're trying to get through the day. <laughs> Although I did like the shower scene in, in there with, you know, where he's just, he's covered in blood and, you know, he's spitting out his teeth and, you know, it's just, he's gotten, he's gotten knocked around quite badly. Um, yeah. Well, speaking of that suit and Scott McDaniel, I mean, I love Scott McDaniel. Nightwing's like my favorite DC character over there. So I loved his run in the nineties on Nightwing. Uh, sure. I, I've talked to other creators. Did you ever, is there ever a thing? I don't know if it's all writers feel this, but it's like, you write a story a certain way based on who you have drawing it. Oh, absolutely. If you're in sync with the partner that you're working with, that that's the, the best thing you do. And, you know, you learn about each other and you learn what you want to, uh, what you want to do, mm-hmm. but also what you're good at. If, um, you know, if an artist hates drawing horses, and this is a very minor sort of thing. You don't, you don't suddenly put a, a Western scene in or, or, you know, out at the horse ranch. Some people do that but you're not playing to the strengths of what somebody does. And you're also not playing to the, the interest they have. So once you get into a rhythm and I had the good fortune working with some really talented people across a lot of the titles I worked on. And I think I was pretty simpatico with the relationships that we had. So you get into a rhythm and, and you, you're able to, to play to those strengths. And with Scott, especially, uh, you know, I think Scott kind of came into his own, if you look at when he came on the book, he had a certain style uh, that he was trying out, maybe. You know, it was it was more, I would say, almost cartoony style, mm-hmm. perhaps. And then when he began to explore the lines and the shadows and the weights um, uh, that he began really on, on the Fall from Grace story, and then he continued through the rest of our time working on the book and then the Electra uh, um, title itself, 
uh, I think he really, um, he had, I knew what he would do, right? I could write a scene and because we had uh, a level of understanding, I knew how it was going to come to life. So I could then give him certain things that I knew he would, he would really uh, uh, turn into a terrific action or terrific emotion or, or whatever. And and also with Fall from Grace, I also heard um, like you had been planning for a while to bring your Electra back. Do you remember at the at the exact point? Was it the beginning of your run where you started thinking about bringing her back? Or well, you know, Electra was always out there, right? Mm-hmm. And and it was the big thing that was always in conversation. And there was a an unspoken you know handshake deal, I think, between Ralph Macchio and um, who was the editor and and uh, and Frank Miller that Electra would not come back. So we never pressed on it hard. Electra was obviously a, a very strong character and a big part of Matt Murdock, Daredevil's existence in life. So every now and again, we'd sort of say, hey, you know, what about, um, you know, what about doing something with Electra? Maybe not. You know, let, let's let's leave that alone. Plenty of other things to, to kind of work with. But it was really um, so there wasn't a big plan from, say, you know, oh, mm-hmm. when we finished 300, let's start planning on bringing Electra back soon for our next maybe big, big thing. But it was as we started to think about what would become Fall from Grace, we're going to hit the 30th anniversary, right? By the time we hit Fall from Grace, mm-hmm. um, at the end of that, uh, what's, a, what's a big thing we could do? And we were riffing on things. We're going to, of course, knock around Matt Murdock's life again, because why not? Um, we're going to we're gonna do some, you know, hopefully extraordinary things. We're going to talk about a new, you know, maybe uh, look for it. Maybe this will be a springboard for some some other ideas. And then in that conversation... Actually, Ralph, I think, introduced the idea finally. You know, we weren't pushing for it. And Ralph said, well, what about something, you know, with, with Electra?" And we said, really? And, and then as we began to think about what the story could be, you know, then that's what, uh, that's really the timeline for that planning. So probably, you know, whenever we start planning on that, 315, 314, around that time is really when the, the real planning began. Mm. Uh, that's when it probably came into real conversation. And And to me, that's as much of what the title refers to, you know, is her uh, as much as anything that happens to, to Matt. Uh, so you put up that big signpost. Yeah. Cause what was it? 314 where Matt's having the nightmare about Electra. Okay. So you're right, you right. telling us she's coming. She's coming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Teasing <laughs> something out. Teasing something out. Oh yeah. Uh, sorry. I'm jumping around here, but no, uh, I got, I, I'm tracking. I, when you said you were going to go back and reread the things, I made sure I did as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm semi familiar with my work at this point. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> It's so much. You, you, you can't, but it's so much. I, yeah. And, and the 90s, it's like. <clears throat> yeah, he, you're, you're one of like the most well-rounded kind of writers. You've been kind of like everywhere. That's something that I really appreciate. Thank you, Lilith. You're Thank well-rounded you. at Marvel as well. Like, it's just a list. Like, do you like doing solo or do you like doing team stuff? Or is it with, just a mood thing? With characters, you mean? Or with, mm-hmm. with other with characters? With characters. Um, I think it really depends on the, the story you have in mind. Uh, it, it, it some really become, uh, you know, lead to that natural partnership. And then, you know, you're going to play off things, uh, uh, you know, doing a, a, I don't know if you ever saw the, um, the Captain America Punisher story I, I worked on, uh, blood and glory, but you could probably have told that story with either cap or, or the Punisher kind of solo, right. Finding this, you know, this hidden conspiracy, you know, uh, uh, you know, going after these, you know, drug lords and corrupt government officials and all this thing. Either one of them could probably tell that story. But once you start to think about them as soldiers and soldiers as people, then there's a real power to suddenly telling a story with two soldiers from different eras. And that's really what's driving the whole thing, as opposed to the plot device of um, the conspiracy and the, the the danger and the war zones and such. Um, so it, I think it really... I've had the the good fortune to do both. I've had the good fortune to do uh, really big, not team superhero books necessarily, but a lot of the the horror work I did uh, with a lot yeah. of the Clive Barker books, uh, especially the Nightbreed stories. They they had it was an ensemble, you know, of of characters there. Um, so that that naturally, while there was one character Cabal who was the main one of the Nightbreed, it was very much about the whole Nightbreed. Right. The book was called Nightbreed. So you had to think about them as a group. And that's where you come in. So to me, it's what's the story? And then you you put your time to it. So do you, <clears throat> do you have a um, 
I mean, are, are, is horror one of your like favorite genres? Because it seems like, yes, you've worked in some horror stuff. You've even bring in uh, the character Terror uh, during yeah. that Dead Man's Hand. Yeah, um, I think so. I mean, I'm not I think so. Yes, I will admit the truth. Yes, it's my real uh, passion. And again, I think you go back to formative things and what you were really into earlier on. And then maybe you deviate away from it or take on other things. But but uh, Halloween was the the national you know holiday in my house. Um, uh, it was what we came up through. Uh, horror in that world was all about you know watching you know great late night movies, reading stories. The most formative reading experience was when you know this college aged uh, you know friend of my mother's you know handed me my first Stephen King book and said, "I think you might like this," and y- you don't give a the shining to an 11 year old but i you know but maybe <laughs> but but you know it all clicked and um and certainly there's lots of elements you know through there you know terror has some some horror not some horror elements he has a lot of horror elements to him although he he operates as a you know a mercenary yeah um i think sometimes i would especially as i was working a lot on the clive barker material and a lot of the superhero stuff every now and again i would kind of lose track of what i was doing and i might try to introduce too many uh, horror elements into the uh, superhero universe. Ralph, I remember one story I turned in. And he was like, mm, "I think you've been spending too much time writing the Barker stuff. Redo this one." And <laughs> 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 Which uh, why he was such a great editor. Oh, and also, I mean, a reoccurring villain that kept popping up early on, which. I think certain writers either don't get this guy or just make him the butt of the joke sometimes. Uh, Tombstone. Yeah, Tombstone was fun. Tombstone was was badass. I mean, he was he was trouble and weird and and you know we tried to give him some you know motivations to what he was doing as opposed to just this uh, you know alabaster um, hitman. Uh, so he he had a lot of uh, great qualities, and I, I re recognized that going back and and reading you know some of the the work there and and seeing what I was able to do with him. Oh, yeah, Um, because, yeah, he started off your run. Uh, I love the stuff with the hand, but then, of course, yeah, like you were talking about, uh, I think, around issue 300, you did the fall of the kingpin. You were the first guy that actually took down the kingpin. I know. (laughs) How many times has he come down since then? Does he does he keep going? Here he's mayor now. I haven't read the recent one. Yes, he's I'm mayor right now. I, I mean that that Marvel New York is so weird. I mean, for a while, J. Jonah Jameson was mayor. Now Wilson oh, Fisk really? is mayor. Okay. Yeah, it's about as re- it's about as strange as the real New York. It's fine. I was going to say yeah. What's, what's, what's it's the strange difference? Real right politics now. now. Yes. Um, well, that was really my my. I think that that was the pitch. I think that got me the book um, because uh, when Ann Ann Nascenti was leaving the title, then I I I was. I heard about that in advance or, or, you know, just as she had announced, but she hadn't left yet. And my good friend, Steve Bucilato had said, you should try out for the book. Um, and I didn't really know that I was ready to try out for a book like, like Daredevil, but the proposal I wrote uh, really just started off with that idea. I said, we've, we've danced this dance how many times, you know, Matt Murdock goes right up to the line. Uh, Kingpin's right up to the line. Uh, it's fun. Those are nice scenes. There's a lot of tension and, and such. But they start to lose their energy after a point because you can't make threats and then not follow through on them. So that was really the thing to say, let's let's get rid of the fat man. Let's have him actually take it down. And and that was the seeds I was trying to plant, even getting into those those initial stories. Right. Punisher, Ghost Rider, Mm -hmm. the hand, these tough, tough situations where tough, tough characters were making extremely. uh, direct, aggressive, assertive decisions, right? Ghost Rider operates in this way. Punisher operates in this way. Um, and and not that Daredevil was going to become either one of those, but that's the moment of realization where he sort of says, all right, I've just been through this. I've just seen this. I'm not going to become those guys, but I'm going to, I'm going to aim all my competency, Lilith, <laughs> you know, at this problem and and go right after it. I just, I mean, follow the kingpin with, I mean, again, reading as a kid, I mean, before, <laughs> the hand sacrificing naked people in a nightclub, they're, I don't know, it didn't phase me for some reason, but then that first issue of uh, follow the kingpin when he sleeps with typhoid to take her out of play, I was like, whoa, this is, now, yeah. now this is some um, adult content, yes. 
you know, I mean, that was like, I was talking with, uh, on a different, uh, it wasn't a podcast. The guy did a, uh, Steve Wilbur got together, me and Greg Wright, Mark McLaurin a, a few weeks ago. And we thought it was going to be an hour long conversation and it being like a four hour <laughs> live stream, uh, which was a lot of fun, but exhausting. And um, we were talking a little bit about that scene, but you know, that was one of those things where that wasn't in the proposal. Like I didn't yeah. say I'm going to have to take down the kingpin. I'm going to have Daredevil, you know, sleep with Typhoid Mary. But I think those are one of those things that as a writer is like a gift that you get, you know, mm-hmm. from the universe or your brain in the sense of it was such a wild idea to have um, such a daring idea, such a, a, the, but you, if I was to think about it intellectually, I never would have done it. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I was able to do it because I was, I was still new. I had some talent. I was, I was, and I just let, the muse sort of take me in that direction in a, in a, in something that really worked, uh, logically, um, illogically and, and, and paid off. I think if I had thought too much about it, I would have backed off from it. Hmm. Right. And, but it, but it has that moment of saying right away, he is doing something that needs to be done oh, to yeah. get to this end goal. Oh yeah. I just took it, uh, you know, in this case, I guess the ends do justify the means because it's like, you know, he, he, he does get Mary the help she needs in the end. Exactly. And, and two, it's like, I got to take the Kingpin down. How many lives I'm going to save taking down the Kingpin. Right. And I compliment your, uh, you know, big issue 300, big battle between Daredevil and the Kingpin in mm-hmm. the background. And, uh, what is that? The bus station. We see uh, Peter Parker and Mary Jane. Big 300 issue. You could have had a big <laughs> Spider-Man jumping in the fight. You didn't. You held off. You know, Peter Parker's just like, yeah, hit him for me. <laughs> <laughs> Give him one for me. Yes. Uh, yeah. That was a, well, that's the fun thing about the Marvel Universe, right? Or any mm-hmm. any shared universe. If you've got some real moments like that, you, you, can, uh, you can bring in the characters and they don't have to suddenly become standalone, mm-hmm. but you can have that that nod to it. Which, um, which I think you have to. Otherwise, you 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 become very singular, and and you forget about the rest of the world around you. Oh yeah. Um, but like I said, really good. And again, held back on that Spider Man. You know, you could have had the Spider Man team up. Although you did get to it eventually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had we had a, we had a fun. As it. everyone does. <laughs> As everyone does. You know, the Spider Man. Sure o- that's a secret mandate somewhere. <laughs> the the Spider Man office, I think, was right next to the Daredevil office. So that was uh, there was always a lot of you know, back and forth in discussion. Uh, you know, we didn't actually have many mandates, you know, then um, it was, I think as time has gone on and when I've talked to folks who are more involved than I am right now, um, which would be at all because I'm not involved this, <laughs> with that world. But um, I think there's been a lot more dictation of your story will go in this direction or you will do, go in this direction. The, the only time we had that was, you know, maybe some of the major crossovers uh, that were going on across everything and we had to do a nod to it. But, um, you know, we would want to use characters cause they were interesting or sometimes they were, you know, they were sales boosts, right? I was going to say, let's face it. It was the nineties. So like the Punisher, Spider-Man goes dry. What would, would get you extra and, eyes on the book? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was, and that was a challenge we always had was, and that was a lot of a dramatic, uh, <laughs> conversations with the PR folks, uh, and the, and the, uh, you know, the marketing folks about, Listen, we're not a spider. We're not a mutant. What do we need to do to to get some attention on this book? And then sometimes that did lead to, um, uh, like the dead man's hand story was mm-hmm. was was manufactured uh, in a sense of listen. If we do a story like this and we cross over some of these characters, will you guys do a little bit more of a push? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We'll do that. And then we did it, and I think we got a little poster out of it, but it didn't. It didn't really get the the push, but it was a fun story, and those are fun people to work with. I mean, they were, uh, you know, Fabian was Chuck Dixon. You, you know, I, you know, we all went out to lunch. We all just sat down and we just kind of mapped out. Here's a here's a story. Here's the people we want to use. You'll end your piece there. I'll pick up the baton here, and and we all, you know, we all got along, so it was easy to to hash something like that amongst ourselves. I thought it. I thought it came out really well. I mean, yeah, Daredevil, Punisher, and Nomad in uh, Lil's favorite town, Las Vegas. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, uh, and that there was that was a chance, you know, in that particular story. I remember uh, was right at the opening. I think I got, I had Matt just going, uh, you know, bugging out because oh, yeah. this the sensory overload of Vegas, and and I had not 
actually been to Vegas at that point, but having finally gotten to Vegas like four four years ago or so, I, oh, I that definitely sanitized Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I definitely, I definitely heard the sensory overload, even in some of the places I went into. Oh, I, I, I believe it. Yeah, because like in uh, what was it two thousand seven, I flew out to Vegas for my cousin's wedding, and like the minute I like landed, I like started feeling like I wasn't feeling right, and I was thinking, oh no, it's just like Matt Murdock. No, right, right. So it's the whole thing to get you ready to spend money in Vegas. When I went to Vegas, it was, I went the wrong way. We'd gone on like a kind of like a two week road trip through the Southwest, so we spent a lot of time in the. In mm. the desert moab you know grand canyon we were in all these outdoor places and then we finally looped around to vegas which was <laughs> you know cool to see but but we should have gone the other way right start in vegas then go out into the great unknown and kind of cleanse ourselves see that was the problem with me i think i flew out what was it like october it's, it was october here in the northeast so it was like 50 degrees i fly out there it's 80 degrees so oh, it's yeah. like yeah, yeah it just felt completely different uh let's see what else did i want to ask are you Am I going to have to be the one to ask about Daredevil Batman finally? Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no. You know, you know I have no problem talking about that, man. About? How the heck? Um, well, you know, a Daredevil Batman team up Sales. Was, was something I think anybody would want to do, right? Oh, At that yeah. point, there hadn't been one. Uh, and uh, so it was definitely a, a nice brass ring to kind of go after. Uh, I think it was, uh, you know, it was uh, just a conversation and a, and a proposal um and and saying why wouldn't we want to put these two characters that have the it, there's always been somewhat comparisons to them some of the comparisons to them i think also have to do with the fact frank miller you know worked on both and did extraordinary mm -hmm. work on, on both mm -hmm. um but they had that sense of they're they are stitched into their cities they are they are kind of operating often at, at night um they you know they they play out in a more natural hard setting so there's a lot of the mob ties and stuff like that yeah yeah so there, there's a lot of natural you know qualities to that um and so it was something i was leaning i think pretty hard into to to try to just get going saying why can't we do something here's a proposal here's an idea here's a team uh at one point i had been hoping to actually reteam with uh lee weeks on that and uh and and you know we talked a lot about that ultimately lee decided it wasn't for him at that time. Uh, and then it was a lot of conversations and to, that wasn't an easy one to, to crack the code on uh, just uh, in terms of very high profile characters, especially Batman and how do you handle him and what do you do with him? And so there's a lot of conversations with not just Ralph Macchio uh, as the daredevil editor, but Denny O'Neill as the Batman editor. And, and what do you do with these? And my first, geez, my first swing of that story that got thrown out. I mean, by me. I mean, it was just. Uh, I. I. I think I. I hit send on it or faxed it at that point, probably. <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, almost as soon as I did it, I, I called Ralph and said, "Yeah, read it if you want, but I, I don't like it. You know, it's not. It's not doing it for me." And then went back in, and I think going back in is then when we started to find the the interesting qualities of that Harvey of, Dent angle was ex not exactly it. that that was that was the second past Lilith that was that was disco discovering that made the story right and and that was the the piece you know to really play out play out in a more interesting way I mean it's I love comics like that won't get made anymore because <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see a number two <laughs> yeah why do you think they don't want to like play ball with each other anymore and do those crossovers it's just the corporate atmosphere at this point um, everybody wants to stay in the little corner I would imagine I mean I think there's just um you know, because now both are when the, when that was done, they were they were owned by corporations. Uh, certainly, um, DC was owned by Warner Brothers at that point. Um, Marvel was owned by whoever. But I think the operations were still more, maybe just in, interoperational. And there were also a lot more people. Maybe there are now, but there were certainly people there who knew each other and had worked with each other. Right? Mm -hmm. Denny had been at Marvel. Yeah. Ralph and Denny, you know, had worked together. A lot. Um, Mark Grunwald um, uh, and Mike Carlin, you know, were were f thick as thieves, you know, fast friends. So, you know, when they when somebody said, "Hey, let's do a, an amalgam universe," or "Let's do you know these kind of intercompany crossovers," it was based as much on friendships and relationships that had already existed, 
as anything else. So that that certainly would would enable that type of thing to happen a lot quicker. All right, Lilith, you know I got to go there. You, you brought up the magic. You brought up the magic name. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Mark Grunewald. Uh, the biggest regret in my life is I'll never be able to interview him. Uh, yes. So you worked with Mr. Grunewald. I, you know, Mark. I wish I'd worked with Mark more. Um, and and Mark intimidated me, and he should not have, uh, because he was he's a gem of a was a gem of a person and a very giving and and, and hysterical, you know. But I a person uh, in a in his in his in the way he operated. Um, but I was a little bit intimidated by him because I didn't know him very well, and he could be very, I guess, stoic in in certain ways on the outside. So I was like, I, I can't play in this guy's you know field. So I didn't approach him as much as I should have and learned more from him. But all that said, one of the first real stories I took a swing at, not a, um, a goofy inventory story or a licensed story like, here's my Thundercats idea, you know, was for a book he had done called Solo Avengers, right? So these were short stories, 10-page um, stories, maybe 11-page stories. So it was like half a book. It wasn't even a full book. And he, I think, had come up with the uh, idea specifically to help up and comers do more work. So I was writing with a woman named Margaret Clark at that point, and we pitched this Dr. Druid story, right? Dr. Druid, if he's still around, you know, was sort of a, a Dr. Strange also ran, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, we wrote this kind of story and Mark came in, we were on staff at that point, we were editors in the Epic Comics line. And, uh, you know, Mark came in and spent an inordinate amount of time going over this 11 page story and telling us what works, what doesn't work, if we want to take a swing at it, you know, what, what to, you know, he wasn't going to buy the story then, but if we wanted to go back and think about these things. So to me, this was like, oh my gosh, this guy is like, you know, he doesn't have to do this, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, that was a, that was a passion, not just for comics, characters, even minor ones, but also, you know, for, for people. And um, so that was my, my big attempt, you know, to, to work with him. I think, I got to work with him on West Coast Avengers where I did a, a story with them as well. And he gave us, you know, uh, good guidance on that. And then um, as the practical joker in the in the office, you know, he allowed us to pull, um, you know, some crazy stunts on some of his assistants and, and such now and again. <laughs> That's what I keep hearing. He was he was the practical jokester. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, he would run game shows at uh, at uh, in the office uh, at the conventions. If any, you know, you ever seen any of the conventions in that time, there were always uh, over the top on stage, you know, Marvel versions of of different game shows, and he would he would be the instigator and usually the ringmaster around that stuff. Hmm. But a real, you know, I mean, he's often been referred. I'm sure you, you've seen this before. Is the kind of the soul of Marvel? You know, the soul of hmm. of the passion for the for the characters the sense of reverency that probably everybody thinks is is happens in the Marvel bullpen. You know, this was a guy who really personified so much of that. So, you know, true, true loss. Oh, yeah. Uh, but back to your stuff. Uh, I think so, a lot of the stories I had loved from you are, are the ones that don't get the, the attention they deserve. Like, you know, like the day in the life stuff, like, you know, issue three, 304 and 316 yeah. where – Matt Murdock just like takes like a chunk of time and just like you just get like montages of him like going through the city or going through the subway just like helping people. Thanks for noticing that. Yeah, three three oh four is one of my favorites. Um, and you know when I when I was writing Daredevil, um, even once I moved out of the city, um, I continued to to get a subscription to New York Newsday, which at that point was one of the I think best in city uh, newspapers and don't, no longer exists. And, uh, and I would collect just these little bits, uh, you know, guy, you know, gets into a traffic altercation, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, fight at a, um, at a bar with a chainsaw, <laughs> you know, these little things. And, you know, no, no one of them was, you know, was a story unto itself, mm -hmm. but, but really, and then the one thing that, that was that trigger point for 304 was, was a story that had said, we just went 36 hours without a murder in New York City. Like that was like the headline in Newsday or something yeah. like that. And I said, wow, 36 hours without something like that. What could Daredevil do in those 36 hours? And then, you know, you get this stack of all these other little incidents and how can you, you know, go through and actually, you know, map out um, what he could influence and touch before the next big explosion of murder or real menace. So many of those incidents in that story 
were things I, I saw, had read about uh, in, in one form or another, and just figuring ways that he could kind of come in and out of it was was a nice choreography. Uh, and, and, uh, and then the subway story was trying to do that again. I don't think I pulled that off quite as nicely, but it was definitely a way to sort of see how he, you know, how he, how he's in touch with the city. No, I mean, I, I, I love both those stories. And I mean, 316, I mean, I think it's a credit to your writing. It's like, it's a great story. And it's like, I don't know, sometimes if you read it for the first time, you don't even realize you're like, oh man, he'd even put on the costume, this whole issue. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think at the end didn't, uh. I think like Ralph and I think Pat Garrett, he was the assistant editor at that point. They were like, well, here's a pinup of Daredevil. Yeah. You never saw the costume. Yeah. All this year, you know? <laughs> but that's what I just love about like street level characters. It's like, yeah, you can fight super villains, but you can do like these small like character piece stories and stuff, you know, just. Right. Right. You know, that, but- that's the thing I think I was thinking about Daredevil, at least to me, was. You know, he struggled with, okay, the, there, there was, of course, the conflict between the lawyer and the vigilante. But, you know, unlike some characters where, well, you know, you've, you've heard there is no Bruce Wayne, only Batman. Or Bruce Wayne yeah. is the disguise for Batman. Or, or you know, there is no or, – or there's a big demonstrable shift, you know, between the two when they, when they put the, the costume on. Uh, you know, I think there was a lot more overlap, for me at least, with Murdoch is Daredevil and Daredevil is Murdoch. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I found that that was, you know, so he could become and do what he did no matter what. I remember writing, um, uh, the, the last issue of Daredevil I wrote, which was many years after, uh, you know, I stopped the regular run when Tim Toohey had invited me and Lee Weeks back to write a story that was the end of the first, um, the first volume, right? It was before Joe Caseta was coming in. And so we, we did this big, um, sort of unusual suspects inspired story of all these explosion on this big ship and all this stuff. But I remember writing in, in a courtroom scene, um, Matt Murdock saying something and being a competent lawyer for a change. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, originally I think I was writing it, you know, you know, he said something articulately or he said something and, you know, in a very nice way uh, or soothing voice. And then I said, this isn't right. This guy's voice, if I hear it in my head, puts you on edge. You know, he is a dare to even the way he speaks in court, you know, has to be some quality of of, um, you know, what he's doing. And I think that's something else that the TV show got right and how they, they did it. You know, he's, he's a bit of a mess even when he's he's walking around. You know, he never really shaves. He's like, you know, he's <laughs> like we say, poor Foggy. He's got a lot of mess. To clean poor up. Foggy carries a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, like, and again, another one of those stories, uh, the two part uh, three twelve and three thirteen, with that one, uh, the the pizzeria arson when he uh, tr- he's trying yeah. to clear that girl's name and trying to find out who really, uh, you know, it's like a mystery. And again, you get the lawyer part, you get the the vigilante part, but I mean, really good story. And it's just like, yeah, again, there's no super villains. There's just a list of suspects. And yeah, you know, rereading it, it was like I was wondering to myself, like, why didn't I make this a super villain or like you know some <laughs> villain with with you know, ferocious fire powers or something. Um, but then, um, you know, the mindset at that point was, well, this, this is exactly what you, you picked up on, right? It's mm-hmm. that, that sense of, of he's living the city, he's living the street. So it was, it was perfectly in line with what we were trying to do at that time. And again, even just like what, like we we're saying about the Spider-Man team up, I mean, I guess could you categorize the Surgeon General as a super villain? But I mean, she was basically just someone like stealing people's organs. Yeah, yeah. She. I love the Spider-Man stuff in that story, and I, I, I think that that was the Barker one that you know I was mentioning that Ralph threw the script. Uh, and said, do do this again, <laughs> you know, because um, and uh, and you know there was a lot of that urban myth, uh, yeah. body organ harvesting, you know, storylines probably going around at that time in the media and. And, um, and, and, you know, she had, yeah, super villainous qualities. Certainly she, you know, putting herself in that outfit and acting in that, in that way. Um, but, uh, uh, there was definitely a, a little too grisly for my taste now yeah. in, in the, in looking back at it, not, but, uh, but the Spider-Man stuff was, was a lot of fun to do. 
I mean, it was a little different, especially if like you're like a Spider-Man fan. But I mean, it was it was good. I I always love it because you know they have to go trolling through the nightclubs for yeah, I know. for this woman. <laughs> and I so know, recruiting recruiting Peter Parker was was a lot of fun. I know he's just like yeah yeah you're 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 good looking. Well, we'll throw you yeah, in the nightclubs, and then you know in pure Clark Kent fashion, Peter just like slaps on a mustache as a disguise. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was like something. Uh, you know that I don't know if we and Scott talked about that, or maybe he just like threw that in there, and you know that would have been one of the things. You, once you start to get into into a rhythm with somebody, you know they start to just trade things with you, and that was because a lot of the Daredevil issues, in fact, all the Daredevil issues, you know, were probably written in Marvel style, mm-hmm. where you write them as a plot. My plots were fairly detailed, so I'd give all the beats, but it was then the artist was interpreting a lot of things. So sometimes you get back um, things you didn't expect. And, and they might add a detail or they might break what you thought was going to be one panel into two panels or four panels might become a splash page. So sometimes your script in your head, you know, changes uh, and, and, and sometimes it becomes a lot more fun by that discovery. Oh, yeah. I mean, especially, yeah, you and Scott McDaniel. I mean, even Lee Weeks. But I mean, just you could tell the, the machine was working well because the art was great and you get like I said you got so descriptive with those senses you really build a scene you know the sounds the smells that's great I'm really th- thank you for again noticing that and, and and checking it I really appreciate that oh yeah and then again we're, we we talked about uh, Fall from Grace and then even after right after Fall from Grace you went no slowing down you went right into another big story the uh, Tree of Knowledge so yeah, I, think, I guess were you a big computer guy? I was. I mean, yeah, I was. I was definitely getting you. You know, your influences. You, you know, definitely uh, flow into the things you're working on, right? So, mm-hmm. I mean, that was a burgeoning uh, aspect of whatever sub society at that point. Now it's clearly where we're we're living. Uh, you know, full on um, and looking at that. You know, again, recently on some things, it wasn't like I was projecting the future, but. I think there's a whole scene between Cap and Daredevil talking yes. about digital rights and privacy and and such, and you know it's still a conversation we're being affected by now. But I was I was a big fan of like Mondo 2000, which was a magazine about the the future. Then Wired magazine had just come out, uh, and so you know seeing those aspects, how could you can you play those out and make them part of the street? And there was a lot of discussion in the things I was reading about how hackers you know were were street level characters in a way There's certainly like a william gibson cyberpunk you know aspect to that uh so it felt uh really interesting to play that out and that whole group uh, the whole system crash uh you know a set of villains uh, i enjoyed the hell out of them um you know a lot i would would like to have done more with them i think or bring back some aspect of them if i had continued on you know playing with them later but uh, it got me a nice little write-up in Wired magazine at one point, actually. I was reading this little mini review of a comic book, and I'm saying, wow, that sounds really familiar. And then they got to the end of it and said, oh, it's Daredevil by... <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, I wrote that. <laughs> but yeah, I like that story just because it was like all about, you know, the technology, the future, and then you contrasted it with Captain America, you know, yep. basically the man from the past, and it's just like, yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of r- really fun discovery with that, and, and uh, you know, I think some good villains, some good scenes, some good outwitting of the the situations, uh, even playing with some of the villainous characters there, I remember, uh, giving them a little bit more dimension than just simply, oh, they're all Hydra, Von Struckers, you know, automatons. Yeah, Yeah, uh, that that group was good, but the snake root from Fall from Grace, I thought, was the... Oh yeah, one of the one of the best threats you came up with in your run. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, they were they were a uh, they were a lot of fun to work with, um, and just um, you know, you th- I think about the amount of research I try to put into those things to draw them out. And I remember borrowing ninja books from Carl Potts, who was very uh, knowledgeable about that uh, uh, whole error and and type of fighting style and group, and and thinking through what do we need to do. Uh, to bring characters with these specialties to life. And, and um, you know, certainly that research paid off at the end of the, the Root of Evil story, that whole idea of dipping the, the armor in poison <laughs> and poisoning your, your, um, your enemies, you know, as you fight was, was a, a very real ninjutsu move um, that they would sort of like play out and things. So, um, you know, it's not like just recasting the, what they could do, but, um, but, 
but being inspired by it. Uh, I, I that storyline especially and that snake root group and what they went through and that uh, felt to me like it hit on all cylinders then and and again looking at it recently, uh, I'm really really proud of having played that out. Oh yeah, I mean, like I said, really good. I thought that was one of the biggest threats uh, you came up with. Um, and then the end of <laughs> your end. Well, I don't know where where was. It? I mean, I know the credits and stuff and the end but but the no the end of the run it's like so you didn't know you were no longer gonna be yeah. writing the book you know I, I you know i've been dance dancing around this for years in no real hidden way right you know alan yeah. I, alan and i talk now and again i like <laughs> alan a lot you know alan's a good friend of mine you know i don't i don't know why alan did what he did um but yeah i mean it was for whatever reason and whatever cowardice chicanery whatever motivations were right i i was i was the writer on the book i was actually talking actively about uh you know spinning off other daredevil titles we had other daredevil mini projects we were we were talking about doing and um and then i was told by uh the person who was editing daredevil at that time that the new editor-in-chief of daredevil because at that point, Marvel split itself up into five editor in chiefs, and there were five mm. different groups. Right there was the mutant group. There was the maybe I, I can't remember what the other one was, but Daredevil fell into kind of like the street level hero group. Right, Pun the Punisher, Daredevil, other characters like that. <laughs> uh, so the the editor who I was working with, you know, called me because I'd known her for a long time, and and said, uh, "Yeah, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but you're off the book." <laughs> and I said, "How how am I how am I off the book?" if you can't tell me about it, <laughs> you know? So it, it was this kind of weird, you know, may, maybe he'll just go away sort of thing. And of course, you know, I didn't own the book. It's work for hire. Uh, on one level, that's all what kind of happens, but you would mm -hmm. expect there to be a discussion of something, something, at least that's the way I would have handled it when I was an editor. So, um, you know, I was part way into that story and uh, what would become, um, uh, you know, the cruel story. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and I was, uh, I wanted to finish it off. They gave me the option to finish it off. I could use the money. Um, but at the same time, I was probably just feeling like this isn't going to be a great story. It's not going to go anywhere. And Alan Smithy, for folks who don't know, was was typically the the credit a director would put on a film when the director no longer felt that that film had turned out the way they liked. They liked. So it's kind of like the Hollywood credit that goes on a film when the director feels the film's been taken away from them or has turned out in a way and they don't want their name associated with it. So I, I put it on there as a kind of a, and for that reason, but also because, you know, I, I had a film school background. Uh, so I was being a little too clever for myself, but, um, but, you know, looking back at the story recently and rereading it, I'm like, you know what? I, 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 I pulled off probably a lot of what I wanted to pull off. I think probably where it doesn't come together is, well, what would come next, yeah. right? What would have come next in terms of of putting the kingpin back in this position with the quote unquote new Daredevil, <clears throat> or all these things that these other characters had now rediscovered about themselves uh, from that terrible night in that diner? What what would we have done with that? And I'm sure I had ideas for that and would have played that out and not just let it be like kind of like a one note uh, thing. But when you're halfway through something that you think is going to lead to the next thing. Because bringing the kingpin back in at that stage was certainly starting to set the stage of him becoming not the full uh, kingpin in the penthouse again. But but what is he going to do now? What's he going to? How is he going to start to play his his street level magic? But then you know you're halfway through and you're like, all right, do I want my name on this? Do I not want my name on this? And so I said no. But now it really doesn't. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember not. I I didn't find out about Alan until years later because I remember first reading it. And I was like, "Who is this? Who is this Alan guy? He's trying to be Chichester in the worst way." You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, like, there's moments of it that that are me, right? Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, probably my my heart was not fully in it, and so um, again, I think it's I think it's 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 a reasonable story, reasonably executed. Um, but uh, but not with the same level of of passion and sort of knowing that this is leading to to one more thing. So so you don't remember what plans you would have you you had for if you had got, kept going. Well, I know that you know well the, the kingpin, kingpin would have, yeah would have become rise, yeah. you know more of a more of a, a 
powerful street level operation. That was certainly one thing that we were going to continue to do in the book and then have him form a new relationship with this new daredevil. Uh, that was certainly, you know, what was going to be, be happening there. Um, I, I remember that we had talked about two specific mini series that we were going to do. One was going to be a, um, cause when Ralph Maki was still the editor and before they had transferred over into this new universe uh, of editors, uh, we had talked about um, almost like a daredevil um, grouping. You know, we could always mm -hmm. have like a couple, three daredevil stories going. And one of them was almost a daredevil year two. Uh, you know, John Romita Jr. and Frank Miller had done daredevil year one mm -hmm. in a way, but we were saying, okay, so now what happens? Like, mm -hmm. what do you, what do you do now? So we, we had talked a lot about that. And then I had this uh, really keen idea. I thought uh, that I was going to do with an artist, uh, Paul Ryan, uh, which was essentially a Daredevil time travel story where we were going to send Daredevil back to, um, and I knew exactly how we were going to do it, um, at, you know, get him back. I wasn't sure how we were going to get him back to the future, but I knew how we were going to get him back there with some like ruptured Fantastic Four gadgetry. But um, we were going to send him back to old New York. In the, in the 1800s, there was a, uh, a corrupt uh, uh organization at the at the level of the city government run by a guy named boss tweed who essentially was the real life kingpin hmm. and so we were going to send him back to to this um to this time era and have him have to confront that and that was another opportunity i thought to play with the senses because the new york of that era was you know rife with the stink of slaughterhouses coming off the you know the river and and you know, the whole different shape and form of the city. So it would have been his city, but it would have been a nice place to, to play with the senses, hmm. have him confront a villainous character who he would recognize a lot of things from in terms of being very Fisk like, but a lot of new situations. And he was going to, the, the time travel line I remember was going to send him back like Terminator, like, you know, <laughs> naked and stripped of everything. So he was going to have to fashion an 1800s oh. kind of look for himself. Um, and it was, uh, I remember a lot of great thinking about it, but it, it all went up, you know, into Alan Smithy smoke. And <laughs> <clears throat> and I was going to say, was the quote unquote new daredevil going to stay around for a while? Because I know after you left pretty much by 350, they had brought, you know, Matt Murdock back. Oh, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't read a lot of that stuff. I, I love Mark DeMattis to death. I uh, think he's a fantastic writer. Um, I, I understand the whole thing was like, kind of gotten rid of very quickly as like a delusional activity or, or something like that, you know, it was passed off really, really fast. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, there definitely was a, a, a plan, you know, to shift things around and bring Matt back into it because the, the, the point of the Batlin character, the Jack Batlin character as a, as a, as a true mask, right. Mm -hmm. You know, and that he's wearing for, you know, that reason of a guy to protect my friends, a little bit of a trope in comics or whatever, <laughs> But the point of it was to, to actually have him realize, I need the lawyer to be the vigilante. Yes. And I need the vigilante to be the lawyer that I can be. So by not being the lawyer, right, uh, and, and being this sort of, you know, the Jack Batlin character is a little bit of a street level grifter and trying to trying to get his uh, sensibilities uh, from things there was was for that realization to happen and realized he had to be Matt Murdock as well. So there was definitely a, 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 a legitimate plan for that to, to have meaning to him and to the story. Um, but we obviously never got to that. Or I never got to that. Yeah, Jack Batlin was very interesting because like Matt was like trying to pretend to be a sighted person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was fun. You know, and, and yeah, seeing things and, mm -hmm. and trying to play it out there um, as, as opposed to the, you know, the usual opposite. But but I guess um, nobody wanted to track in that direction, or they just want to get back to well, Matt Murdock's Daredevil. This whole other thing is too is too much to to play out. So there was a quick quick solution, I guess. Well, I guess after they brought him back, they kind of lightened up the character for a while too. So I don't know, if, you know, he was all almost had almost like a I don't know, like a Spider Man sense of humor. But I mean, they took it more in that direction almost. Yeah, I know there was some. I want to say a little bit goofy stuff and and yeah. i know when tim uh, tim too called me and and lee on that 380 mm -hmm. um uh you know i said well where where are we at right now i haven't really followed the character very much and and he said good i don't want any of that <laughs> 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 i 
I want I want what you and Lee did, and that's why I want you guys to you know like no one really cares right now what I do with this last issue, and but I care. Tim cared, and uh, and he says I want you guys to do what you did then, and uh, and Lee Lee took a little bit of convincing because you know Lee is a fantastic creator and, and artist and and had been doing much of his own stuff both mm -hmm. with other writers and his own writing where he's really good at and uh and initially he was like well this this feels like i'm going backwards a little bit which lee has never gone backwards um but so we we talked about what we could do and what we could play out in it and what it would mean for for us and the character that had really you know been a been a big jumping off point for both of us both um I think as creators and getting better and as, as friends and partners. So, um, uh, that I remember that, you know, that wasn't a, an immediate done deal for him, but I'm, I'm delighted that it finally, you know, clicked in our, in our heads. It was one of my favorite stories. Okay. Uh, well, before we let Dan go, Lilith, do you have anything else? Okay. I just have to know, cause this is actually how I originally discovered you when I was younger, spinning doomsday's web. Like, uh, it's like two things you wouldn't think to put together, but two, two oh. things I love. I have this, I have this gigantic Black Widow thing right here next to me with that story in it. So, yeah, <laughs> like, it. where did that come from? I, I personally enjoy it. Like I said, it's two things I didn't know I wanted until it was in my face. And I'm like, yeah, obviously, this is great. One of like, the best Punisher kind of like team up things. That pe I don't hear a lot of people talk about. Um, no, it was a, that was a that was a really fun story to put together. Um, you know, there were definitely like lots of. I'm going to take the cellophane off this finally. Uh, you know, there's lots of. Um, uh, you know, there were certain graphic novel like projects that was originally like its own you know, little graphic novel sort of thing. Um, and I think it was probably more uh, initially a Black Widow story, right? A bit of a bit of a spin off of the spy work I was doing with Nick Fury and, and Shield and and playing her out. But um, but as you we were talking about before, sometimes you get a chance to to craft a better story about a character when they have a foil to play off of. So uh, you know, bring the Punisher in may have been probably a little bit of all right. Black Widow's popular-ish, but Punisher's popular. So why don't we use him as a as a way to draw more attention to this? But it's definitely her story. Right, she's the one who really goes through. Like she's all style, grace, finesse, and there's just this big blockhead Bruce. <laughs> yeah, this, this, yeah, <laughs> exactly. She, she's like skill and espionage, and he's like a wrecking ball. Um, but, uh, but you know, that was a that was a combination of thinking about the characters and also again having a little bit of a of a of a clip file of things that someday you know you want to do something with, but you don't know what to do with them yet. Right, so that whole doomsday device right that's in that story that that whole uh i think a ramjet right some a giant flying crowbar that sucks in air and turns it into nuclear energy and spits it out the back and irradiates and you know the land and turns into a wasteland it was an actual thing <laughs> you know it wasn't something like i i made up it was a project called and i think i name check on the story project pluto and and so uh you know, you get the these moments and you say, there's a story here and, and a plot at least. And so um, putting the two together, as you say, gives you contrast. If if there was another wrecking ball character you put together with the Punisher, that's not much of a story. But when you combine them as in the way you said, it, it becomes something uh, something where you get that contrast and you get to, to build out. So that was a lot of, a lot of fun to do. Um, I always wish Larry... Uh, Strowman uh, had uh, had given me one the one shot I wanted of the inside of the plane that sort of showed like the mechanism. Uh, that was the one damage of uh, like writing things in plot style, which I described it. But then when I got it back, it was it was a a shot of the Punisher and and Black Widow looking into the plane, but not seeing the plane itself. So I think there's actually like a, a word balloon that is literally the Punisher saying, "Black Widow, do you see what I see?" Yes. <laughs> Yes, Punisher. The inside of the plane is a is a bomb. <laughs> but you know, those are the moments where you get creative. Yeah, I that's mwah, Chef's kiss. Honestly, like I said, I, I like a lot. Obviously, I like the Punisher stuff you do because I like I just like that take that you had for him, making him thank you. But like also keeping that that frankness of being you know that blunt blockhead at one man <laughs> on a mission. <laughs> that. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I, I love this competent word. I'm going to be using this a lot for for the, well, thinking about these modern characters. Well, comics, the heroes are not competent. You know, how do, like, how do you, mm, how I don't do you... believe that you. I don't believe you actually got those guys in that web, Spidey. I I don't know. <laughs> Really? Yeah, that's it's yeah. interesting because I'm. I mean, a lot of the stuff I'm reading nowadays is not the mainstream stuff. You know, I'm reading like you know, Sweet Tooth and and you know a lot of other you know publishers. So is that you finding that's a common thing that the characters, the, the heroes, don't seem like they, they? I don't believe it. They're not believably competent or like really? like yeah. The the big two are suffering from it. They just do what they want to do, event after event. It's just like, wait a minute, did we ever wrap up? Nope. Okay. <laughs> I picked up, you know, I picked up, um, and this is no ding on the on the creators, but it was just unusual to me because I picked up um, Batman. Is it metal? Was it uh, oh, you know where, where it was? I have my these... feelings about. Oh that. yeah, <laughs> Dark Knights metal. Yeah, well, right. You know all these alternate like evil Batman Jokers or whatever. And now I know Batman. Like we talked about that, you know, just a little while ago. I love Batman, and I know Batman's history, and I know Batman's this and that and the other thing. I couldn't follow that story for love nor money. I mean, it was, it just, it became, it was so, maybe it was the competency aspect too, but it was so inside its own universe that it was unrecognizable. I, I, I couldn't get into it. I was like, I can't follow what's going on here. And I'm, you know, I read and write sometimes very complicated things. So I don't mind stories that kind of need a little bit of unpacking, but it felt like it was. Maybe it's a very plot-driven approach to things. Maybe that's a, a an output of, if indeed inside these companies there is, you know, dictates of what you can and can't do, or you have to get here or there with crossovers. I don't know. I just feel like just go back to the '90s, start fresh. Let's take that kind of attitude. It's just I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I mean, it's it, the nostalgia. <laughs> it, you know, we, we we didn't really think about it then, but you know, you'd go into an editor's office and you'd pitch something, and they would say. Yeah, okay, do that. And and it wasn't, you know, a really, I cannot think, maybe I was just lucky, but I cannot think of many instances where it was very manufactured in that way. There was a little bit of that on some of the the Midnight Suns, uh, uh, the horror line of characters, Ghost Rider, Night Stalkers, Morbius, that was sort of trying to become its own little sub-universe. Um, but by and large, you know, we'd go in with a story. What do you think of this? That sounds pretty cool. Do that. And then if you had a good editor, uh, and I was lucky, I think I did, um, you know, they, they'd help you course correct and, and brighten up the dull spots and uh, and make sure that you, you you stayed on target for what you promised to do in the story. Do you do Oh, deadline. <laughs> well, too, do you think uh, there's not as much interaction between the writers and the editors anymore, especially f- like face to face, especially, well, this year? Well, this year we're all stuck, right? Yeah. I don't know, uh, you know, Phil. I don't, I don't, I don't have that that inside track. I remember meeting, you know, a couple of years ago for just coffee with, um, you know, one well, well, well known creator who's still in the business, and um, and he was saying he was feeling everything he was doing was very dictated to, mm-hmm. right? You know, it was it was sort of like this is, you know, we're kind of told what the story has to be and where it has to go, and 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 he was clearly a bit frustrated by it. Now he might have been an N of one, but he was a big name, is a big name. And so I was kind of surprised to to hear that from somebody of his caliber, because I would think if anybody's gonna have carte blanche, it's gonna be a guy like this. Hmm. Um but um I don't know about because even in even you know, you have to you have to figure some of us who were in the New York City area, which I like I live in Connecticut, so um and at, and at the time I was doing a lot of the Marvel stuff, I was either in the city initially or I moved upstate New York a little bit. Mm-hmm. Certainly folks like us could get into the offices, um, but that wasn't everybody. There were certainly many creators, you know, across the country and they would deal by phone or mm-hmm. FedEx at that point. And a lot of great stories came out of it. When I was an editor at Epic Comics and I did a lot of the work, I was with uh, Brits. You know, I'd worked with a lot of the British creators so those guys were in a different time zone and across an ocean and uh and you, you were able to get a lot of stuff going so i don't know if it's I, I don't know if that it's distance necessarily so much as it's the way people are coming at it or it becomes insular yeah. right that's that's always a danger i think with you know when i worked with archie goodwin um who was the, the lead of uh, of epic comics and and um i worked with a lot of 
like you were saying, Grunwald, like really, yeah. you know, uh, big folks, you know, a lot of these people had also come from other places, mm. right? They had, they had other influences. They love comics. And so they put all their experience and channeled it on, only on comics. Um, sometimes if all you've ever done is comics and then you're channeling only stuff at comics, that could become maybe inside baseball. I don't know. I'm guessing like, you know, there's like, still good stuff all around, and like I yeah. said, there's there's other companies, and you 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 kind of run the gambit of those companies back in the day. So. Oh yeah, I, I wanted to work anywhere I could, and and try to get as many things going, and and uh, you know from Classics Illustrated, the Moby Dick thing I did with Bill Sienkiewicz, to uh, you know uh, Hercules adaptation for you know Disney comics. I mean, it was <laughs> you know it's. Uh, <laughs> um, I love your Dark Horse work in the Steel Harbor. Section. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm actually uh, doing uh, trying to get a new project going with uh, Carl Waller, who I did uh, a lot of the work with Dark Horse with. So um, uh, fingers crossed right. on something happening there. Yeah, keep us abreast of that news for sure. If you I can. will. I oh, will. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, that's a nice segue. So, uh, yeah, I was going to ask you what you're working on now or what's coming up. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, uh, you know, I, I segued out of comics, uh, you know, for the most part, you know, in the in the early 2000s, uh, really. Probably the last thing I did was around 99, you know, or, or so. A um, couple small stories for some independent things that never, I think, came out. You know, I did some stuff for some anthologies. Mostly, I mean, the work I've really done now for the last stretch of time has been a lot of writing and advertising uh, work there. But, uh, you know, just recently in the last uh, couple of years, an idea that Carl and I had uh, many years ago. Um, and uh, it was, it's a bit of a horror influence. Somebody described it, uh, which I think I'm going to steal, as uh, the, the good place meets from dusk till dawn. And uh, <laughs> Go on. <laughs> you have my attention. And, um, a little perked up a good place. <laughs> and, and, uh, and um, you know, it's, it's, it's this idea we had. Carl had come to me with this crazy idea. I, I, I'm thinking truckers and dimensional portals – and maybe there's a stripper in there somewhere. Carl's a great, you know, just like, kind of like free, free association <laughs> guy. And I'm listening to him on the phone many years ago. And I'm like, Carl, I, on a good conversation. I don't know where this goes, but thanks for calling. And then I sat down and it was like, you know, you, you suddenly feel like you're, you know, you've got this Hamilton moment of like, you know, your pen is like attached to your, your brain and something else is channeling its way through. And so I write this whole concept out about this, um, uh, you know this this what could those interdimensional things be what are those truckers delivering where are they delivering them um you know is there some kind of uh infernal aspect to it because i like horror um you know somebody hijacked into the service of this delivery system this you know fedex system for the most evil parts of the universe and i write this whole thing out almost straight out uh and and it it clicks and me and Carl are, are loving it, and um, and then we sort of lost touch. Like it didn't it didn't grab hold. And then we reconnected a couple of years ago, and the first uh, words out of both our mouths were like, "You remember that thing?" And and it was really weird that it had actually stayed with both of us. And I've become a big fan of this idea that that um, ideas are like are like actual uh, ethereal genie like things, <laughs> and they will visit themselves upon you. And if you're not smart enough to do something with them, they're going to go on to somebody else. And and so I said to Carl, this thing stuck with us for a reason. If we don't do something with it now, this is our last chance to do it. Somebody else is going to go. It's going to go and visit somebody else. So we've been working on it, and I've written like a five-issue first story arc, and I'm working on the second issue six story arc, and he's going to design the characters and lay the pages out. And, and so we... You know, we're going to start shopping around to publishers or Kickstarter it, you know, hopefully within the next, you know, set of months or whatever to see if there's some some mojo that can that can happen there. So definitely I'll, I'll give you guys a heads up if that's happening and and, uh, you know, appreciate a mention if, if that is the case. And maybe when it becomes real, you know, we could chat again. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> definitely with the mentions and the uh, chatting again. Definitely. But uh if anyone else wants to keep up with what you're doing, where should they follow you? Social media or website? Um, yeah. I mean, um, I, I'm semi-active on social media, but if stuff is kind of going on, I think probably the best place is, you know, uh, you know, Twitter is great. And just DG Chichester is my, my handle there. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to my website, which is capitalistfiction.com. 
but it's it's really that's just kind of like a holding place it's kind of like a portfolio for a lot of my my work it's not very active but if you follow me on on um on twitter then as some other things are starting to kick into gear that would be a great place to see i'm, I'm starting a newsletter with some of the stuff that i'm talking to carl about um you know probably in the next couple months and that would be a good place to you know if folks are interested jump on and sign up and get some inside inside talk and some ideas about writing and such this has been a lot of fun thank oh, you guys thank you oh you've been a you've been a great guest thank yes. you so much for coming. terrific are you both in the same semi location or did you guys meet you know since i'm in florida in uh, florida i'm in pennsylvania i'm in pennsylvania i'm like right outside pittsburgh yeah okay but how did you guys, just curious, like, how did, did you guys know each other before you started the show or? <clears throat> no. no. I had him on one of my old podcasts and oh. kind of just started doing her, our own thing over here at Southgate Media. She, so ba- yeah, she basically just put the call out on Twitter. Yeah. Back. What was that? Like 2014 or something. She's like, oh, I need a guest for a podcast. And yeah, I was like, I was like, oh, come on. I've never done a podcast before. But <laughs> <laughs> before you know it. And, yep. That's the best way. Sometimes, you know, things just click that way in synchronicity, and it's great. Oh, yeah. All right. But, yes, thank you so much for taking uh, like a Saturday morning to talk to us. Again, My we pleasure. really enjoyed this. And Good, good, good. Looking forward. Now, did this was this going out live as you were doing this, or you guys are going to edit this and post uh, it? On, well, we, gotta, we do the live thing, but then, yeah, this will be edited for the podcast later. And... Marvelous. Marvelous. All right. Yeah. Shoot me it a note. When you... Yeah. We'll let you know when it's live. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of fun. Have right. a great rest of the weekend, guys. Thank you. You too. Thank you so okay. much. You bet. My pleasure. Take care. That was great. <laughs> it was. And we're still live. <laughs> I know we're still live. Okay. I'm just reminding you. <laughs> I'm not the one that's going to be cursing up a storm. Love Hellfire. All right. So should we get out of here then? Yes. Let's. <clears throat> but yes, um, I'll put in the show notes, you know, the links to uh, Dan's uh, social media, the, the website. So. If you didn't get that the first time, look at the show notes. All right. So, but if you want to get a hold of us, especially if you're a creator, uh, if you want to talk to us like that, you know, especially if you want to talk, you know, next time we can have a Charlie Esser probably, uh, email us, capesandlunatics at gmail.com or call the voicemail 614-382-2737. That's 614-38CAPES. And... You can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, you could watch this video on our YouTube channel. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, well, you could see me and uh, Dan. Lilith, of course, hides in the shadows. Uh, but yes. Naturally. <laughs> yes. But so, yes, links to uh, all our social media, the YouTube channel, our Patreon, where we're talking all things Star Trek, uh, merch, everything, all in one place. That's Linktree, L I N K T R dot E E slash Capes and Lunatics. And hey, support our sponsors, uh, Tweaked Audio. <laughs> Get yourself some headphones. Oh, man, you shared a Charlie last night. <laughs> you probably, <laughs> are you, were you listening to this interview with Dan on uh, quality headphones? Maybe you missed something. You should go get yourself some Tweaked Audio headphones. Uh, just have him do the commercials. <laughs> I told you, I just want him to record it and I just got to hit a button. But, uh, oh, and Hunt a Killer. Michelle, Michelle Gray needs Michelle your help, help, guys. Come on. That's right. Espe- on it. Especially the month of October when they're putting out what the Blair Witch thing. Yep. I'm excited. Yeah. So use uh, Southgate, the promo code Southgate for both of those for a handy dandy discount. And if you love podcasts, go pick up Pod Life the Book, now in digital and paperback. Uh, volume one. Volume one, yes, because volume two is in the works. Yes. But go on Amazon and pick that. You can pick that up either way. And when you're on Amazon, use the link for Southgate Media Group right down there in the show notes. Uh, doesn't affect you at all. Doesn't affect your uh, price, your I think you, your Amazon Prime, nothing. But it uh, kicks a little over to Southgate Media Group to help us support this show, Southgate Media Group Network. And of course, you know, <laughs> Molly Southgate's dad, Rob. Make it rain. So says Master Do. That's my says, Charlie. I'd throw in Charlie as a reference. All right, Lilith, where can the uh, people find you? Uh, if you guys want to hang out with me on the interwebs, you can find me on Twitter at Lilith Hellfire. Or, of course, on Instagram with the cool kids and your hip grandparents at Lilith Hellfire 86 or at Lilith Hellfire 69. I never disappoint. I never disappoint. That's right. All right. 
Thank you for joining us. Thank you, to Dan. Great interview. We we really do need to talk to him again when he has a new project or something. And I'm jealous of that voice. I know he has, he has like a voice for a radio or a podcast. Don't give him any idea. I don't know. Oh, I shouldn't have asked him about that. I think he might have a he might do a podcast or something. I mean, I mean, you saw that mic. I mean, he's he's doing something. No. Oh yeah, they did like a four-hour stream. He did say. <laughs> It's like, don't give Phil any ideas. There you go, Will. One, one, one sitting, we did not all our podcasting for the week. I mean, can't go with killer, but. <laughs> Your dogs be crossing their legs. All right. Oh, but for another week, we have been your capes. Although we know it's singular. <laughs> Thank you, Dan.